Hello, and welcome to the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. I'm your host, Benjamin Douglas, and this is the show where each week I read a chapter from a different indie author. Thanks for joining me for today's reading. Hey, everybody! Welcome to episode number 31 of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. As always, I'm your host, Benjamin Douglas. Thanks for being here with me this Friday evening. If you are a reader, then I hope you really enjoy the indie author you're going to be exposed to tonight. And if you're a writer, especially an indie author, I really hope that you find this informative and useful and it gives you some context in what a new indie author in fantasy is doing. Because tonight I'm going to be reading an excerpt, actually the prologue, from the uh, first in series, The Summoner and the Seer, book one of the Dark Light Universe, by indie author C. Gold, an up-and-comer. Yeah, so um, I'm going to begin, as I always do, (laughs) by reading C's Amazon author bio. Sea Gold is an avid World of Warcraft gamer and book-reading junkie. She enjoys reading a variety of genres, including fantasy, science fiction, urban fantasy, paranormal, and a variety of romance combinations. Her worlds are influenced by her background in electrical engineering, physics, computer science, and math. After a long career in software testing, she began writing the stories that kept clamoring to be told. Right now, she's writing fantasy in the Dark Light universe and science fiction in a series based on techno-mages, like the ones that appeared in Babylon 5, who use technology to simulate magical effects. Her website may be found at www.thegoldenelm.org and her Facebook page is at https colon slash slash www.facebook.com slash author dot c dot gold. Cool. And if you um, if you're interested in what you hear tonight, I do recommend that you check out the show notes, http colon slash slash the book speaks podcast dot wordpress dot com. I'll have a link, as always, to C's website and to her Amazon author page. If you just go to Amazon and you just look up C Gold, (laughs) you may or may not have luck because there are so many things sold on Amazon. And um, apparently quite a few of them have or are colored with or look like or somehow involve the word gold. So (laughs) there's that. Um, If you do do a a search, maybe search for the title, The Summoner and the Seer. C is another one of these authors who is active on keyboards. And it's so cool because I feel as though keyboards is one of those resources where there are like waves of authors. Like an author class comes in, comes on the scene, indie authors, and they like hang out there and other places like the 20 Books and 50K group and other forums and stuff. And they help each other and they do like group critique and they build each other up and then they kind of like eventually tend to go their separate ways i mean you don't you don't really see like the first people who are on keyboards there much anymore some some are but like you know hugh howie or like amanda um hawking <laughs> right you don't really see them that much <laughs> There are reasons uh, for some of that, but but a lot of it, I think, is just that they get so into their own thing that they're doing when they get big. This is not saying everyone gets big, but um, they go off and they branch off. And even even people like the the wonderful, magnanimous Chris Fox, who you know I fairly idolize as far as an indie author goes. Um, you know, he used to he used to post a lot more on keyboards than he does now that his star is kind of on the rise. And I, part of that is because he's got his YouTube channel platform, but part of it's probably because he's just busy, frankly, you know, and, and um, Keyboards is one of those places where you find your community and you you give and you get, right? So while, while you're there, 
<clears throat> you um, you ask for help, you ask for feedback on blurbs and covers, and you ask for marketing advice, and you also participate in other people's threads, and you sort of share your own experience and wisdom and what you've been hearing elsewhere and kind of loop everybody in. So anyway, long story short, this is where I found Sea Gold, is because she and I seem to both be part of the same class, if you will, or the same uh, yearly community, I guess, <laughs> on keyboards, um, <clears throat> which I think is super cool. I mean, there are there are a handful of us now that are that are kind of building some you know informal connections, and we never like met, but it's pretty cool. Um, and I'm so happy to feature her on the show today. I got to tell you, uh, reading this work, it was like, yeah, yeah. Like you start and it's like, okay, okay. And then like a couple pages in, you start to, yeah. And then a couple more pages, you're like, yeah. <laughs> like By the end of this prologue, see, <laughs> I'm hooked, man. I want to read more. So I actually, initially I told her that I was going to read the prologue and chapter one. <laughs> I've reneged on that, partly because the prologue turned out to be kind of long the way that I read it, just because I read slowly, I think. And also partly because uh, the prologue is really set apart. It really is a true prologue. It happens before the events in the novel. And I didn't want to um, spoil that delicious curiosity that one is left with at the end of the prologue, because this horrible thing happens to this kind of terrible character that you still really like because you're obviously seeing things seeing things through his eyes and you you need to know what's going to happen next but you don't <laughs> so everybody go check out sea gold's book the summoner and the seer it's dark light universe book one and it's worth mentioning that c also has a 99 cent short story prequel i believe it's a prequel it's in the same universe the short story um, and that's also on our Amazon page there. So I'm going to, uh, you'll be able to get to that by the link. All right. I feel like I'm jammering on, uh, yammering on, I don't, it's late. <laughs> so I'm going to get on with the reading once more. I want to apologize to anyone who subscribed or has been listening. Yes. The show's up later. Uh, it's going to be up later for a while on Fridays. Just a reminder. I used to record the show like midweek. It's making more and more sense to do it kind of late in the day on Friday with my current schedule. So this is normal. I'm not slacking off. <laughs> it's just the new normal. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks to C Gold. As always, the reading you're about to hear does not come from an official audiobook, and it is performed and presented here with the author's consent and permission. All that good stuff. I hope you really enjoy it. I have got some heavy hitters coming up, you guys. I don't want to say too much, but I'm going to be reading from a certain comical, farcical <clears throat> series of sci-fi called Space Team. And I'm going to be reading from a certain, <laughs> a certain indie author superstar who hangs out in Florida on a boat all the time. It's not Hugh Howie. It's the other one. <laughs> it? So come back. You're going to be hearing some really cool stuff over the next few weeks. I hope you find value. I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you have a heck of a good weekend. Thanks, and here is the reading. The Summoner and the Seer Dark Light Universe, Book One by C. Gold Prologue The Sentencing Radcliffe Dernhast, the most powerful wizard in the world, and the mage commander of the Kaladin army, was hauled from his dark cell and slammed up against the wall by two of the largest guards he'd ever seen. He glared at the rough treatment, but said nothing while they clamped a set of leg irons around his ankles. Larger twins to the restraints already keeping his wrists and magic bound. As they shoved him up the stairs, laughing when he stumbled, Radcliffe memorized each brute's face and vowed to repay their treatment tenfold. 
They dragged him down dusty back corridors and shoved him into a brightly lit room. One guard kept a bruising grip on his arm, while the other fed the ring hanging between his shackles through a clamp embedded in the floor. It snicked shut with ominous finality. Not going anywhere now, the one gripping him taunted. His sadistic grin revealed several broken teeth, probably from a habit of mouthing off. Radcliffe's hateful glare bored into the guard's eyes. While he remained silent, his thoughts churned. Just give me one second with my magic, and you won't be going anywhere, ever. I promise it will take a long time for you to die. I will hack you apart one tiny piece at a time. The guard's eyes widened, and his smile slipped. Not smiling now, are you? Finally realized who you are messing with? I will find you and make you regret this. Radcliffe let his mind run with images of what he'd do to everyone responsible for his present circumstances. The guard blanched at whatever he saw in Radcliffe's expression. He snatched his hand back as if from a viper and hastily backed up a step. His eyes began darting between the wizard and the exit. You about done? He asked his partner. Yeah, the second guard stood. Let's go. The first guard bolted. The second one cursed under his breath and rushed to catch up, leaving Radcliffe alone. Good riddance. He tested the bonds, keeping him locked to the floor. When nothing budged, he gave up and looked around. Wooden paneling and brightly glowing mage lamps gave the small room a bright and cheery feeling, as if overcompensating for its grim purpose. There was no furniture at all, except for twelve ornate ebony chairs, perfectly lined up and facing him on a raised section of the floor. They stood empty at the moment. That was when Radcliffe realized he was in the Council's private judgment chambers, one of the few places in the fortress he'd never visited before. He'd heard the rumors, of course, that people who came here disappeared. They've already made up their minds. That meant there would be no trial. His enemies were taking no chances. They knew he still had supporters in the military. Before he could speculate any further, a door at the far left opened, and the members of the Council of High Mages filed in. Representing the surrounding regions, they were the second highest authority in the Empire, answering only to the Emperor. Each was dressed formally in snowy white robes with gold trim. Once everyone was in place, the door slammed shut, and they took their seats. Radcliffe glared at each one as hot fury boiled in his veins. These men and women sitting in judgment were the same people who had eagerly agreed when the Emperor had ordered him to use whatever force was necessary to annex the surrounding kingdoms. He gave them what they wanted with swift brutality, and they had no objections until he was betrayed and lay helpless at their feet. 
Then they turned on him like she did. What have you done, Janine? Radcliffe's speech was slurred as the drug started to take hold. You men are all the same, easily led with your man part. Never once did you see me as a real person. I was just a bed warmer, a dumb, pretty girl who was clearly honored and overjoyed to be in your company, pleasing you. I couldn't possibly have my own thoughts and feelings, my own motivations. Radcliffe lurched back and stumbled against the table, knocking the empty wine glass to the floor. It shattered, much like his heart. I love you. Liar, Janine spat. You are incapable of love. His knees gave out as the poison overwhelmed his system and cut off his magic. But you said you loved me, he hissed through his locked jaw. I lied. She bent down, and he could see the loathing in her crystal blue eyes. Do you think anyone could ever love you? Pasty white, spindly, scarred monster that you are? Radcliffe could only stare back at her in shock and growing horror. How could she have fooled him for so long? Janine pushed him to the floor and stood over him now with her dagger, eyes gleaming in happy revenge. You always enjoyed having power over others and slaughtering whole villages. How does it feel to be on the other side? This isn't you, Radcliffe whispered, barely able to speak now. My parents lived in Westbrook. You remember the town you destroyed to set an example? Well, here's my example. She plunged the knife into his stomach again and again. Well, what do you have to say for yourself? Radcliffe blinked and looked down at his stomach, half expecting to see blood and guts spilling out. Someone must have stopped his lover from killing him, and then patched him up enough to stand trial, though not without a beating first. Ignoring the pain, he straightened to his full height and stared down his nose at the speaker. Archmage Candlus, who was pacing back and forth at the front of the raised platform in agitation. Radcliffe ignored him and scanned the other council members. Their stony faces and hard eyes extinguished any hope he had that some would be sympathetic. Well, Archmage Candlas asked in growing impatience. Radcliffe didn't remember being asked anything, but he had stopped listening during the long litany of his victories turned conveniently into crimes. There was no denying some of the things he'd done, like Westbrook, were considered brutal. But after news traveled of that tragedy, the remaining cities in the West Spire Kingdom surrendered peacefully. Fewer total lives were wasted doing things his way. Would you have torched Westbrook if you knew Janine's parents lived there? Of course. The answer came instantly and without remorse. Maybe Janine was right, and I am incapable of love. Then why does her betrayal hurt so much? Shoving all the feelings of betrayal, anger, and heartbreak behind a cold mask, he responded with arctic iciness. It doesn't matter what I say. 
You want me dead because you fear me. Archmage Andural stood and pointed an accusing finger at Radcliffe. Your conduct in the field was reprehensible. Radcliffe wasn't surprised at the man's outburst. Andural hated him ever since the Emperor gave him control of the army, a placement Andural had long desired yet wasn't as qualified for. Radcliffe refused to be baited. I did what was necessary. I did what was asked of me. Don't you feel any remorse for the innocents you slaughtered in Westbrook? This question came from behind him. Surprised, Radcliffe turned around awkwardly, his chains clanking in protest, and spotted a group of women at the back. Three were huddled together in brightly colored blue, orange, and yellow robes. The fourth stood apart and captured his attention with her striking silver hair and violet eyes that challenged him. Clearly she was the one who had spoken, but he had no clue who she was. Then he noticed her green robe and recalled that mages in Westbyre used that color. These must be mage representatives from the newly acquired kingdoms. He looked straight into her judgmental eyes and gave her his honest answer. No, their deaths saved thousands more. Radcliffe refused to lie, even to save his own skin, though he doubted anything he said would save him now. One of the women cried out, and the other two pulled her into a comforting hug. The woman in green stood unmoving and maintained eye contact. While her face revealed none of her feelings, Radcliffe got the impression she was somehow looking straight into his soul. Let her. He had nothing to hide. He stared back defiant until she looked away. Seeking an end to this farce, he faced the council. Just get this done. Archmage Candlas looked only too ready to comply. Yes, let's finish this up, he said, addressing his colleagues. Each gave a subtle nod of agreement. Very well. Candlas turned back to Radcliffe, a grim expression on his face. This council finds you guilty of using excessive force, which resulted in the deaths of thousands of innocents. The punishment is execution, to be carried out this evening at sunset. Wait! It was the woman in the back again. We demand extended punishment. Candlas frowned. As you are not members of this council, it is left for us to decide his fate. But as your newest allies, we require this as a matter of honor to appease our dead spirits. He must spend a minimum of one year in punishment for each life he stole. The grouped women began to argue in raised whispers. Radcliffe turned his head in time to catch the green-robed woman, glaring them into silence. He narrowed his eyes as he studied her. Why was she so eager to keep him alive when everyone else in the room sought his death? Silence! Candlas shouted. 
The Emperor won't accept anything less than his death. His one-time mentor's words sent an icy spear of pain straight through Radcliffe's heart. Of all the people who betrayed him, he never would have expected it of the man he considered a father. Why isn't he here to do this himself? Actually, putting him under the Obliviate spell would be far more satisfying than his death. Archmage Andural countered with a pleasing glint in his eyes. And as for the Emperor, let me handle him. Radcliffe shuddered at the thought of having his mind stripped of all knowledge except for a vague sense that he used to be more. Then, at the end of a year, being forced to remember everything that was stolen and know it would be taken away again in a few hours? The effect drove prisoners mad. While Candlas considered it, Andural spoke up again. Just think of it. The almighty destroyer turned into a harmless, sniveling nobody. Let his name be struck from the records, too, while we are at it. The others were nodding in agreement. Radcliffe's palms began to sweat, and his heart raced. Instead of panicking, he focused on the anger building up inside. He was angry at himself, forever trusting his deceitful lover, and angry at this farce of a council. You should kill me now, because I swear, when I escape, I will personally make each one of you regret ever crossing me. Archmage Andural chuckled. You won't even remember your name. Once he finished laughing, he gave Radcliffe a blatantly false pity stare before adding, And nobody escapes. Candlas slashed the air with his hand. Enough. His expression was grim and tinged with remorse as he formally addressed the council. Let it be known this day that Radcliffe Dernhast is no more. His name shall be stricken from all records, and he shall be banished to the northern wastes, where he will remain for all eternity, under the Obliviate spell. Take him to the preparation room and let it be done. The council members stood and exited the room. Candlas looked at Radcliffe like he wanted to say something, then shook his head and followed after his colleagues. Everyone else left except the woman in green who lingered by the door. Before he could make a comment, his two thuggish guards walked in and the woman stepped in their path. Radcliffe was too far away to hear what they were saying, but based on the shaking heads and sour looks on the guards' faces, it appeared they were in sharp disagreement. After a tense moment, they finally backed off, and the woman came towards him. Enemy of my people, she whispered. You must survive. Then the woman grabbed his chains in her left hand and placed her right hand on his forehead. Survive using whatever means necessary. Sensing an attack, Radcliffe tried to break free, but her grip was like iron. Her power invaded his mind, overran his meager defenses, and cemented the compulsion in place. He fumed at the violation. I will reserve a special hell for you when I escape, he snarled. 
she stared at him with all-knowing eyes. I accept that fate, if you are alive and able to meet it out. That was not the reaction he expected. Speechless and more confused now than angry, Radcliffe watched her walk away. What exactly did she mean by that? Jerked off balance by a swift yank on his chains, Radcliffe's attention returned to his two guards. They presented a problem if he wished to escape. He was still mulling over his options when his group turned a corner straight into Archmage Candlas. Ah, there you are. I expected him to be in the preparation room by now. Candlas snapped at the guards. Never mind, hold him tight. I'll do it here. It was now or never. Radcliffe headbutted one of the guards, taking him by surprise. The sound of bone crunching gave him savage glee. When the other turned to grab him, he shoved him aside and took a shuffling step backwards. Blasted chains. I said hold him! Candlas's angry shout boomed over the scuffle. Hands clamped onto Radcliffe's shoulders from behind, but Radcliffe twisted and sent an elbow jab into soft gut. Candlas's swift curse made him smile in vicious delight. The second guard closed the distance, and Radcliffe absorbed several blows to his ribs before planting his feet and body-slamming the guard into a wall. While the man gasped for air, Radcliffe shuffled down the hallway towards a door that could lead to escape. He got about three steps, when a hand latched onto his arm and swung him around. The first guard, bloody-faced and angry as an enraged boar, landed a meaty fist to his jaw that sent him staggering. The distraction was enough time for Candlas's fleshy hands to latch onto bare flesh. A sharp jolt of power blasted into his mind, and he sank into total darkness. Radcliffe gradually emerged from the darkness, but his mind was webbed by threads of compulsion. He attempted to burn them using his power, but when he reached for it, nothing was there. Panicked, he tried to sit up. The bite of cold steel against wrists and ankles pulled him up short. Snapping his eyes open, he saw his naked body splayed out on the chilly stone floor in a dark room containing only a desk for furniture. Ah, good. You are awake. We can begin now. Startled, Radcliffe strained to look behind him for the speaker, but he saw only shadow. Candlas was so kind, keeping you unconscious when he spelled you. The man's sneer told Radcliffe what he felt about that nicety. I am not kind. The voice gradually shifted locations until Radcliffe saw the figure move into his field of view. He wore a black robe, and his face was hidden beneath a hood. Only his scarred and slightly crooked hands were visible. We have never met before. You can call me Spider. Radcliffe's heart raced. 
he knew of Spider. Everyone did. The man was once the previous emperor's personal torturer, and rumor had it he was also an assassin. He could believe it. There was a sickly, evil aura about the man, and a terrible odor of death. Radcliffe struggled not to gag. I am sure you sense the compulsions in your mind. They are a small part of your imprisonment. He leaned closer, and Radcliffe saw a knife in the man's left hand, coming closer. This next part will hurt. A lot. The voice sounded like a lover's caress. Radcliffe trembled, despite his best effort to appear indifferent. You like to talk a lot. He shot back. It is important for you to feel the intensity of this moment. The knife caressed his skin from his throat down to his heart. Here we are. The figure cooed with delight before plunging the tip into his chest. The blade didn't go deep, but something inside was ripped and torn away. The pain was unlike anything he'd ever experienced before. He clenched his teeth, refusing to cry out. Sweat broke out over his body even though he was freezing cold. The scarred hands lifted the blade, dripping with his blood, and moved to his right wrist. Again, the tip plunged in, and he could feel more tearing inside. A whimper escaped his cracked lips, and his body shook. When the other wrist and both feet had been assaulted, Radcliffe was panting. It is okay to scream. Everybody does, especially on this last part. The oily voice whispered in Radcliffe's ear. The dagger was now glowing with a bright white light that obscured his view of the hooded torturer wielding it. Radcliffe had to clamp his eyes shut tight when it shifted closer. Even through his lids, he saw the light growing brighter. Then the blade's cold tip kissed the skin of his forehead. Flinching, he tried turning his head to the side, but something held it in place. A hot, searing pain bit down, and an agonizing pull of something fundamental to his inner self caused a new level of agony beyond what he'd already experienced. Radcliffe's body arced up, and he fought his restraints. Echoes of his screams reverberated around the empty chamber. A compulsion kicked in to keep him conscious as waves of soul-searing agony tortured him for what seemed like an eternity. Radcliffe barely felt the scarred hands caressing his body over the pain eating at his insides. So much power, the voice whispered with lust. And now it's all mine. He licked his lips and whispered in Radcliffe's ear. So tasty, too. Screw you, Radcliffe croaked past his tortured throat. It was barely even a whisper, but the hands stopped moving, so perhaps he heard. Know oh, this, mage. The voice now drawled with smug satisfaction. I have stolen your magic and bound you to this tower. Nobody else knows where you are, so there is no help coming. 
Your power is mine for eternity. <laughs> His laugh was a foul, bone-chilling sound that sent shudders through Radcliffe. When Radcliffe realized he was alone, he cracked open his eyes. Staring back down at him from the ceiling was an inscribed pentagram with white glowing crystals embedded at each apex and a larger one in the center. Runes of binding ran along the lines, connecting them, and runes protecting the entire construct from harm ran along the circle's edge. The agony in his heart, in knowing that his magic was there, just out of reach, matched the agony of his body at having it ripped out. This time, his scream was one of anger and despair. This concludes another episode of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. Thanks for joining me, your host, Benjamin Douglas, for another indie author reading. If you liked what you heard, be sure to visit http colon slash slash the book speaks podcast dot wordpress dot com for more episodes and for links to the author's website and the author's Amazon author page in the show notes. If you'd like to follow me on my own author journey, you can find me at http colon slash slash Benjamin Douglas books dot wordpress dot com. And of course, if you're an indie author interested in having your work featured on the show, or if you're interested in discussing having your book read and produced by me as an audiobook, feel free to contact me at benjamindouglasbooks at gmail.com. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you have a productive and enjoyable weekend. <laughs>